good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you're at. Thanks for tuning in and listening. This video was, a, it will be a little bit more focused on some concepts around scripture. I've been facing a lot of <laughs> how I'm applying the biblical calling and biblical faith. And there's just a lot going on in the world right now, specifically in the Christian community. And I kind of wanted to just share um, my personal experience and what I've done to refocus my sight on what I see as truth, which would be the biblical narrative. I have a little pocket Bible with me. This is just the New Testament. Uh, it's Christian Standard Bible. I'd probably get one that was English Standard Version. That's definitely my, my personal favorite translation, but I recommend all kinds of translations. Like I believe as people who study or read scripture, it's important to compare and contrast a variety of translations. Um, my favorites are the English Standard Version, the Christian Standard Bible, and the Message by Eugene Peterson. Uh, using those three has just provided a lot of insight for me um, personally, and it's been really fun. Um, so what's kind of happened in the world? There's always crazy stuff going on in the world, right? And recently the Olympic opening ceremony just spiked so much attention <laughs> within the Christian community. Um, rightfully so, you have these claims by the you know director that it's really the the whole ceremony was praising this idea of an ancient Greek Bana Chanel and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right but it's a particular type of like party and so you know it, that's how it ties into the Olympics but there's this scene at the end with a variety of you know drag queens dressed up um, that it mimics the image of the Last Supper by Da Vinci. And so, of course, the entire Christian community has just been in uproar over this. And, of course, feeling, you know, upset about being mocked and, um, you know, taking that very personally since Christians have a deeply interwoven sense of identity within their faith. And so if something is someone or something is going to make fun of Christianity, there's just this inevitable personalization that happens with that for Christians. And the practice of unweaving that is absolutely necessary, yet also very psychologically challenging. And I think for anybody who has a deep identification with a belief system or anything it's it's difficult to separate yourself from it enough to not take things personally um however what has stood out to me the most is you know really the aggression that i've seen from the christian community towards this situation i do not feel it's biblically based personally and i have spent a lot of time over the past year trying to study the Bible in order to come to an understanding of what I'm committing to as a Christian. Um, my, my background is I was a non-believer and dare I say anti-Christian for a long time, for over 10 years. And, you know, I, I was very adversarial to Christians. And so I try to be really mindful of how non-believers are perceiving Christianity because of that adversarial attitude I had towards Christians. I also was very hesitant to label myself as a Christian. So that all provoked like a deep research into the biblical narrative and to understand what is it I'm taking on and identifying with as I call myself a Christian. 
So I digress on that, but I noticed myself having a lot of frustration towards the Christian community. And I am, you know, yesterday I kind of spent my day just really thinking a lot about this and, and jumping back into the New Testament and into God's Word and trying to navigate, you know, number one, what do I do? And number two, as a Christian, like, what are, how are we called to respond to these types of situations that happen outside of us, just in general? This isn't the first, this isn't the last. So I was seeking some guidance and I want to share some scripture with you. What I want to highlight before I, we dive in is that there are two components psychologically to the Christian biblical narrative. And that th they're just like insanely supportive psychologically. <laughs> the first one is this message of hope. That there is something greater than us that is really kind of steering the ship spiritually right all energetically beyond what we ourselves may influence in the world there's something more out there that is actually driving a lot of what's going on outside of us um and with that one of those forces is our creator it is god it is this higher power that is all-knowing that's not reactive, that has the mind of justice and um, wants intimate connection with us. That's a very hopeful feeling. That's almost like when you're a child being guided by a, you know, emotionally secure and attentive parent. The child has freedom to grow and fall and play and learn and not have to stress about these greater burdens that are often put on our shoulders as adults. It kind of restores that childlike wonder and freedom spiritually and energetically, even as an adult who practices this Christian, uh, this biblical narrative, I will specify. So that's the number one, like that is extremely healthful from a psychological basis to have that faith and trust. Non-believers may say, oh, well, it's delusion. Well, if this is a delusion that gives you a significant sense of hope and is contributing to making the world better by those who authentically practice it, and it does bring an authentic sense of connection to God at times, well, then maybe the world needs more of this delusion. That's kind of what I have to say number one. And then secondary comment, there's a beautiful, beautiful book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turk that discusses all the evidence behind this. This isn't just a delusion. There is a lot of evidence in support of God, of a higher power, and of the gospel, um, which is the story of Jesus's resurrection, um, you know, place and resurrection here on earth. So the second part of the biblical narrative that is so psychologically powerful is the idea of radical self-accountability. And a lot, it seems like a lot of people don't recognize that. Like when you read the biblical narrative, that is like bar none, the primary topic of discussion is like, how do you have radical accountability for yourself? to manage being in this world and manage having an intimate and personal relationship with our creator and God. Wow, that was never communicated to me as a child and definitely was not communicated to me when I was a non-believer. And now that I've gone back to the Bible and done my own research, it's pretty insane how paramount of an idea that is. The Bible is not given to Christians to throw at other people. <laughs> other people have not accepted this standard of morality in their life. It's those who have decided they want to engage with this biblical narrative and have an intimate relationship with God through Christ. Those are the people that this book is, is holding a standard to. And you see this when Jesus came, who was, who, what was the group that Jesus was primarily 
talking to and addressing and talking about. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to people who have already committed, you know, their life um, to God and to navigating a relationship with God. Paul in the Bible does discuss how, you know, wow, he thought that this message of Christ was for um, Jewish, Jewish people and came to realize it's also for the Gentiles, which are non-Jewish. So this, it, it is a message for all, right? But just remember that Jesus was flipping tables within the temple when he got upset. It was, it was what was happening within this domain of those who were attempting to connect with God that he was trying to point out the incongruencies with. So really Jesus is talking to those who, you know, initially, primarily to those who authentically seek a relationship with God and let those who have the ears to hear, hear, right? Outside of that. But there are people who have just not made that choice and it's not our place to impress these standards on them. The Bible also emphasizes this perspective that God is in control. That ultimately God is the one who graces us with the opportunity to have a relationship with him. And, you know, Second Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 22, talks a little bit more about this, that, you know, God may perhaps offer the opportunity for another person to understand how they are not connected to God. Um, that says a lot. That, and then there's other scripture in the Bible that talks about God keeping people blind that in itself could be an entirely separate video, but it's just worth knowing that there's a time and a place, right? God is working and looking at this massive scale with these massive amounts of people's lives in a very intimate way and sees all these details and is just setting the seeds at the right time, providing opportunities at the right time and turning one's life over to God and really fully surrendering ourselves is a enormous shift from our human nature and and to expect that to happen with minimal um, perception on the weight of that is is unlikely that's not gonna end up with the fruit of authentic faith right it wasn't until I died to myself and was rebirthed. I was at that stage of surrender where it was like, I full hands up, you know, I am lost. I do not know what to do. The full recognition of that is what led me to Christ. And imagine what it takes to get to that point. Imagine what it really takes to fully get to a state of surrender. God is pulling in all these pieces in someone's life to build up to that and provide opportunity for that. For some, for most, I believe, uh, but not all. That is not discussed in the Bible. You know, there is this trajectory that all will uh, eventually be restored, but it, before that happens, there will be individuals who are not along for that second part of our, our ride in the redemption story. And so we have to be respectful of God's plan and all of that. Um, and really just share our testimony of God's grace. That's, that's how you bring people to God. It's not saying, look, you're so disconnected from God. You need to really work on that. If they saw that as a priority, they would. You know, that's not, shaming people is not how you inspire people to connect with God. And that's what I've seen a lot of is the shame and fear mentality and that this is the reason you should seek God is because you should fear hell and fear the devil and you should feel shame that you're sinning and that you're not connecting to God. I witnessed a lot of that mentality and that was exactly what discouraged me from even considering what the Bible had to say. It's also not biblical. It's, it's not a biblical narrative. Uh, and we can 
if you have a gripe about that and you want to talk more deeply about that, we can whip out our Bibles and sit and have a conversation and, and look at scripture for where we're basing our perspective. But what I want to do more than that, you know, I want to cultivate conversation about this deep stuff, right? And I have to be very watchful of my approach. I do not want to be quarrelsome. I do not want to be aggressive. I don't want to act out of my frustration. You know, I really want to just inspire and encourage people instead. And because this the biblical narrative is so powerful. And the warping of that, I've seen, the warping of it has led to a longer road for me, you know? And so I really do want to help clarify and encourage with the goal of inspiring others to connect with God. So that's a lot of background on where I'm at. I found myself very, very frustrated by the Christian community over the past couple days with the majority response towards the opening ceremony of the Olympics. And, you know, I did, of course, put posts up just like trying to highlight what really was going on with Jesus and how Jesus would have approached this. And there's there was two things that came to my mind immediately. Like, number one, when he's, when Jesus is on the cross, uh, he, he's, this is mentioned in Luke, you know, he's hung between two thieves, and he had just been finished getting literally tortured in a horrific way, and he's, he's hanging, like, barely able to breathe, you know, his entire back just lashed up with, you know, deep cuts, you know, pressed up against this cross, hands and feet nailed to the cross. So just imagine the amount of pain. And he's, he's looking down on those who have tortured him and people are mocking him and saying, oh, you're really the son of God. Why don't you bring yourself down from there? And what does he do? He says, father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. So he's literally in this state of compassion for these people who have tortured him. And here as Christians, we can't have compassion for someone who mimics a painting that represents our faith. That was the first thought that came to my mind is just, we are called to do something far bigger, far bigger. I've done another video on the idea of, of when Jesus says, if anyone should follow me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and carry it and follow me. What is this carrying our cross? You know, from what I see psychologically, the burden of carrying a cross is this psychological impulse to, you know, be frustrated, to demand justice, to, uh, you know, control really try and control the situation that is our our human nature to implement our free will onto a situation to manipulate and change it we have an incredible ability to do that as humans right there's been incredible things done through human will but we have to deny that and and pick up our cross which is this biblical narrative of what I'm going to dive into, really, as a Christian calling. That was the first thing I thought of was when it comes to Jesus specifically. The second thing that was highlighted to me through a post I saw by a pastor put up is that every single person who mocks Jesus or, you know, sins against God, those were the people Jesus sat with. Those are the people Jesus sought out. All of those people would be welcome at a, a table with Jesus. And here we are shaming those same people that Jesus would welcome and embrace. You know, that that to me is also shows this dramatic distortion from what Jesus really represented to those who are following him. <clears throat> Perhaps it's this flooding of emotion that's blinding 
followers of Christ from those little details, or it is a lack of knowledge on the biblical narrative. And it maybe it's a combination of both. So I just want to clarify that. Because if there's any, oh, God willing, there's maybe some non-believers watching this and <laughs> I can bring a note of redemption to for the biblical narrative outside of what Christians are claiming the biblical narrative is through their action because there's a lack of harmony happening within that that I feel is important to emphasize. So <clears throat> those are the things that stood out to me about Jesus specifically. Now, what I'm going to read today are primarily readings from Paul. Paul has, he's the, he has the most books in the New Testament that uh, were authored by him. But he was essentially a Pharisee who was killing Christians, literally killing Christians before he had his coming to Jesus moment <laughs> after Jesus was resurrected. Jesus visited Paul and Paul just had a complete change of heart, withdrew for three years to try and just make sense of everything that had happened, right? He went from a mentality of killing Christians to being devoted to Christ all in one moment and needed three years to process what that meant and to make the connections of what he had known to what the new knowledge was. So Paul has a this beautiful perspective. I personally have a personal connection and affinity with, with Paul and his writings <clears throat> and relate to them greatly, but I wanted to highlight some things that are written by him, not specifically, but just because the concepts are amazing. You know, I could reference a couple others, but like you can see I tabbed up. This is just from sitting for 20 minutes and asking and praying God, what, how do I respond to this situation? How do I manage what's going on? And this, these are the tabs that I found and I realized, okay, if I'm gonna make a video, I need to like pick just a few of them. <laughs> I'm not gonna read all of them to you, but I will read four of them to you. <laughs> so this is from the book of Colossians. It's titled The Christian Life. Therefore, as God, so Colossians 3, 12, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts. So this is a, a directly talking to the Christian community. Right? He specifies, therefore, as God's chosen ones, put on these things. Um, however, I would argue that this is all stuff you should put on towards the non-Christian community. I don't know why anyone would argue that I'm going to only exclusively show... <laughs> compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience towards other Christians and not outside of that group. That would be a really tough argument to make if you're using the biblical narrative to kind of support your perspective. Um, so that that's something worth being aware of, right? We're called for compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And we can ask, what would that look like? How would I act having that? And that's a really incredible point of guidance to consider and something we can ask ourselves before we take any action. This is something like, I'm, I'm not trying to preach here. I'm sharing with you like what I'm trying to implement and focus on at this time. Like, I feel like I have fallen in my frustration against the Christian community and so, I'm seeking answers to, you know, hold that self-accountability and I'm seeking tools to, you know, kind of correct that. So I'm just sharing what, what struck me. Like now I'm going to ask myself, right, is what I'm saying showing compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience? And what, what else could I do to represent those qualities? Um, 
Let's see if I can quickly find the next verse. So this next verse that I wanted to discuss is in James, James 3. Controlling the tongue. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able also to control the whole body. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies and, cons and consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze large forests, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It sustains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a saltwater spring yield fresh water. This, pa this passage is powerful, especially for me who's sitting here like, you know, talking, right? And he's just pointing out the power of our tongue and to the point, right, where he's he's kind of, painting this picture of evil it sustains <laughs> it sustains the whole body sets the course of life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell um so there's this this heaviness right it's kind of coming with these claims and i think he's trying to point out like this is really the a perpetuator of evil is our tongue and how we talk um, the power of the word, I feel, is is really what he's emphasizing in this. I don't think it's this communication of, like, the tongue is evil, so cut it out, right? It's that it's pointing out the power of the tongue. With the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Now, there's kind of this discussion in the Bible. There's a couple of verses that highlight how, like, a sin against others, so being disconnected from God and taking an action towards someone out of that disconnection is as if we are sinning against God because others are made in the image and likeness of God. We, humans have a tendency to justify their actions, their, their immoral, hurtful actions, and say, well, this person did X, Y, and Z, so therefore I'm justified in what I did. But that is not, that's not in alignment with the biblical narrative, nor is that really psychologically beneficial. You won't live a good life if you're reacting to other people in a negative way simply because there is so much evil in the world, right? There is so much pain in the world. And so there is so much evil that could be arguably justified if you have that mentality. So it just doesn't work as a universal practice when you apply it philosophically. That's beyond the Bible. I'm just saying psychologically, philosophically, beyond the biblical narrative, it's not a great way to live. But it's hard because this is like our natural tendency, right? So, you know, we, we have Paul saying like, put on compassion, kindness, patience, gentleness. And although it was addressed, you know, do this to your, to the Christian community, here James is pointing out, it's like, does the spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? You know, if you, you're going to act that way towards Christians and then act a different way towards non-believers, is that really how it works? And James is arguing no. James is saying that, you know, if you're, if you're producing bitter waters, guess what? You're producing bitter waters. So that's, it's, important to be intentional right with how we treat each other and how we treat non-believers but also the power of our tongue how do we speak 
towards other people. Um, really, really inspiring verses um, for me personally. Now, I talked about this idea of God being in control ultimately and how that is kind of this message of hope. The book of Romans is hands down my personal favorite book in the Bible. It is very dense though. <laughs> so I would not recommend starting with that book if you're not taking time to read the biblical narrative on your own. But there is a part in it that is so uh, con like dense and takes all of these ideas and kind of pulls it together. Um, so if I were to only pick one verse to read to you today, this is the one I would have picked. I felt the others were very important and applicable to the circumstance though, for what I'm going through. And, uh, so here in Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction. That's very hard. Be persistent in prayer. That's even harder when I'm frustrated. You know, these things aren't easy, right? We we speak them and say these verses like, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do now. And if you really, really look at like applying it, when you're frustrated, when you're emotionally flooded, when, you know, you want change, passionately want change, this stuff is hope. This stuff is hard. Rejoicing in hope, being patient in affliction, being persistent in prayer. Yeah, that's easy to say when everything is fine you're, and you're having a good day, right? It goes on. Share with the saints and their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Boy, is that a message. I don't even know if I need to add anything that that's when you should just go like free read over and over again that's what I did yesterday I just reread this over and over again so that's Roman 12 through 21 so I hope that these this scripture was empowering and inspiring in this time of of not really knowing how to respond and act in a variety of situations um, you know, James also talks about right in the beginning of James, like, let these challenges and trials be a test of your faith and let it produce endurance. And so I just want to say that, you know, at this point, like, just let it be a practice of faith. Let it be this exercise of recognizing the role that God plays and the trust that we can really put in God. So to end, I want to share a prayer from the book of Ephesians. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width the height and the depth of God's love and to know God that and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God mm. beautiful prayer I pray that for you guys anyone watching this I pray that you 
are overwhelmed with the knowledge of God's love and always the fullness of that love and the love that Christ has to have given his life for us so that we could be reconciled to God, so that we could have a relationship with God amidst our immoral tendencies. If you have any questions on that, that's the gospel right there. If you have any questions on that or anything that I've talked about today, please, please, please reach out. I would love to have a conversation and start a dialogue. I know this is a little bit of a longer video than what I've been trying to keep it at, but and it's more scripture dense than I've maybe normally done, but I hope that it can provide messages of encouragement and hope and inspiration and that we can all especially Christians, you know, just align to the biblical narrative and encourage each other rather than being sucked up into the emotions of taking something personally and trying to react out of that. You know, let's uh, harmonize ourselves with, with the biblical narrative and the authentic Christian calling if we're going to label ourselves Christian Christians. You know, let's have that authentic biblical faith and I'm speaking to myself in this, you know, I, I want to have that level of self-accountability. Self so boy, am I grateful for um, the Bible. That's something I'm really, really grateful for to help with all of this. If any non-believers have uh, stuck around to this point, you know, it's, it's helpful to find someone you can ask questions to because turning yourself, uh, like surrendering to Jesus and God is, is not something we do half-heartedly and your questions deserve to be answered by someone who's knowledge of, knowledgeable about the biblical narrative. It's so dense. So if you have someone who can help guide you through it and give you direction or resources or sharing insights, find that person. If you don't have that person in your life, please reach out to me. I, like, I'd be happy to share resources um, that I've come across and to answer any questions that you might have. And if I don't know answers, I have plenty of resources that I can share with you to help find those answers as far as what the biblical narrative might say. I try to keep my opinions out of it other than pointing out and highlighting how I'm seeing a lot of psychological wellness within the biblical narrative. And that, like, that's my personal background. Yeah, I'm a, uh, in a master's program to become a clinical counselor. So... I, that's what my eyes are tuned to is seeing psychology and psychological wellness, mental wellness, emotional wellness. And I feel strongly the biblical narrative is the ultimate spiritual wellness, but I don't see it as my job to impress this and force other people to have it. Um, it's a process to get there. So I'm here to just support people through that process, no matter what phase they're at, um, whether it's, it's near getting closer to the Bible or far away from that. Just anybody who's interested in growing their spirituality. I want to be a help and a support for that and a cheerleader for that process. It's very, very important in this life for mental wellness. So, well, thank you for taking the time to listen and I hope you have a great rest of your day.